All right, so hello everyone and thank you again for having me. I'm Maria Yuko. I am located in Potsdam, Germany. I've studied English and biology uh, for secondary education. So technically I'm also a teacher here, um, but I haven't left academia just yet. I've done a PhD in Victorian literature in Hamburg uh, finished that one just this year. So um, yeah, very much still connected to um, the academic context, so to speak. And today I will talk about one of the discoveries that I made during the first lockdown in 2020. And Jonathan also just mentioned it that he got into uh, listening to podcasts in 2020, and it was the same for me. And in 2020, I found the horror podcast, The Magnus Archives. And today I want to talk about how it works as a Gothic text and how fan art visualizes the characters and narratives. Okay, let's have a listen to the podcast intro and I'll be asking you for one thing and, on, and one thing only during this talk and that is please put one adjective into the chat that you associate with the podcast once you've listened to the introduction. Rusty Quill presents The Magnus Archives <laughs> Episode 1 Anglerfish waiting for that sound right that's like sort of the signal okay now here we go okay so i see lots of adjectives coming in here death ominous cryptic eerie tense so these are great adjectives right these are like very much adjective adjectives that i would also associate with the podcast some sort of like eeriness some sort of like uncanniness right that we would attach to this intro okay so thank you everyone um, so first, a little summary on my part, right? The Magnus Archives is a horror fiction podcast that ran from 2018 to spring 2021 and became a sleeper hit among podcast listeners. The show was a huge success. And just last week, the producers announced the Magnus Archives too. So we'll get another three seasons at least uh, in the next year. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay, so what does the podcast, oh sorry, what does the podcast description tell us? What kind of story should we expect? So I have this sort of um, little description and I took that from the Rusty Quill website. And so they are selling the Magnus Archives in the following words. The Magnus Archives is a weekly horror fiction anthology podcast examining what lurks in the archives of the Magnus Institute, an organization dedicated to researching the esoteric and the weird. Join new head archivist Jonathan Sims as he attempts to bring a seemingly neglected collection of supernatural statements up to date, converting them to audio and supplementing them with follow-up work from his small but dedicated team. Individually, they are unsettling. Together, they begin to form a picture that is truly horrifying because as they look into the depths of the archives, something starts to look back. So in the Magnus archives produced by Rusty Krill, newly employed Jonathan Sims records himself reading out transcripts from the archives, strange stories full of hauntings and inexplicable events. At first, these don't seem intertwined, but both the listener and John slowly realize that they have become part of a more intricate and elaborate narrative. His co-workers and John himself have to gauge whom to trust and how the recordings work together. And the eerie feeling is engendered via the uncanny stories that John reads out and the happenings around him, as well as through the analog medium of the recording device, featuring atmospheric sounds of the tape running in the background. 
Most importantly, the podcast reliance on a single sense, auditory perception, heightens the sensation of hauntedness. And this, I would argue, is what connects the collection of tales to the Gothic. The Gothic draws from the feeling of eeriness and the feeling of anticipation that something will frighten us. Here's what Chris Baldick suggests marks the Gothic. For the Gothic effect to be attained, a tale should combine a fearful sense of inheritance and time with a claustrophobic sense of enclosure and space. These two dimensions reinforcing one another to produce an impression of sickening descent into disintegration. The fact that we can only hear what is happening, the narrative is of course complemented by sound effects, etc., heightens this notion. Everything happens only when we listen to it, a fearful sense of inheritance and time. And the story is somewhat contained in our ears, even if we see the events in front of our eyes, a claustrophobic sense of enclosure and space. The eerie feeling is thus created by the medium itself and the stories add to the uncanniness. So what do we learn in the inaugural episode of the podcast? This is something that I'm focusing on in the following a little bit more. John has just been made archivist at the Magnus Institute, an institute concerned with weird encounters and unexplainable experiences, and records the first statement, originally given by Nathan Watts, about an encounter with a strange figure in Edinburgh in 2012. Okay, so let's look at the general structure of a podcast episode for the, in the following bit. It usually starts with John giving a little intro or a couple of members conversing before John reads out the statement, which is either a pre-existing one that had not been recorded by his predecessor Gertrude or is a more recent one. After the statement, John summarizes his follow-up investigations and draws his conclusions about the truthfulness about the statement, and particularly in the beginning, doubting most of the stories. For the later episodes and seasons, this changes as the meta narrative takes up more space, featuring more and longer conversations with multiple archive members. Let's dig into John's introduction to the Institute a little. Most of the transcripts have been made available by Rusty Quill, so for the next couple of slides, you find quotes from um, these transcripts um, that you can also find on the Rusty Quill website. Okay, so John says. I've been working as a researcher at the Institute for four years now and am, am familiar with most of our more significant contracts and projects. Most reach dead ends, predictably enough, as incidents of the supernatural, such as they are, and I always emphasize there are very few genuine cases, tend to resist easy conclusions. When an investigation has gone as far as it can, it is transferred to the archives. Now, the Institute was founded in 1818, which means that the archive contains almost 200 years of case files at this point. Combine that with the fact that most of the Institute prefers the ivory tower of pure academia to the complicated work of dealing with statements or recent experiences, and you have the recipe for an impeccably organized library and an absolute mess of an archive. This isn't necessarily a problem. Modern filing and indexing systems are a real wonder, and all it would need is a half-decent archivist to keep it in order. Gertrude Robinson was apparently not that archivist. It is going to take me a long, long time to organize this mess. I've managed to secure the services of two researchers to assist me. Well, technically three, but I don't count Martin, as he's unlikely to contribute anything but delays. I plan to digitize the files as much as possible and record audio versions. There's some will have to be on tape recorder as my attempts to get them on my laptop have met with significant audio distortions. Alongside this, Tim, Sasha, and I, yes, I suppose Martin, will be doing some supplementary investigation to see what details may be missing from what we have. I try to present these in as succinct a fashion as I can at the end of each statement. I can, unfortunately, promise no order in regards to date or theme of the statements that are recorded and can only, and here I guess it would say, apologize to any future researcher attempting to use these files for their own investigations. Okay, let's digest this for a moment. So John explains his role at the Institute as following into the footsteps of Gertrude Robinson, who has passed away and who, according to John, has not been the most diligent researcher. As he explains, the archive is the place where stories end up that seem only to lead to dead ends. That is when John and his co-workers step in. Most importantly, he has to record these statements on a tape recorder instead of a more modern device due to what he calls significant audio distortions. 
a first sign that the archive might, might not be your regular workspace. Jonas uses the first episode to introduce the listener to the Institute, but also explains his plans and decisions for taking certain actions, such as using the analog medium of the tape recorder with its accompanying sounds and why he even decides to record the statements in the first place. Perhaps most strikingly, John's explanations root the narrative in an almost academic context, meticulous research with libraries and indexes, heightening the idea that what we listen to is coming from an actual institute one can find in London. Finally, note the year the Institute was founded, 1818, the year that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and thus perhaps the first science fiction story ever, was published. This is an interesting connection as the Institute and its archive are also dealing with stories that are rooted in the supernatural, but that carry over into the real world, adding to the gothic character of the podcast. Next, John starts with the statement. This is what happened a couple of years ago, so I apologize if some of the details are a bit off, says Jonathan, uh, says Nathan Watson in, in, at this point. I mean, I feel like I remember it clearly, but sometimes things are so weird that you start to doubt yourself. Still, I suppose weird is kind of what you guys do, right? The statements are usually set in the past, and the people giving them are also remembering things from the past. Memory and how things might have played out tend to be important factors here. The people confess to the haziness of their memory, but as this person, Nathan, notes, weird is kind of what you guys do. The Institute is thus also a place for people to seek out when they encounter the weird or have a recollection about a somewhat strange experience, one that they do not know how to process by themselves. Like this, the archive presents a place to vent and to, in a way, let go of these memories that have come to haunt the person. Okay, so in the story, we hear Nathan Watt share, share his experience of what happened at a party one night in Edinburgh. He had a somewhat strange encounter with a shadowy figure, and afterwards people even disappeared who were in the same location. He offered the figure a cigarette, but thankfully it disappeared at the side of his phone and he describes the figure in the following terms. I stared at the stranger and as my eyes began to adjust, I could make out more details. I could see that their face appeared blank, expressionless, and their skin seemed damp and slightly sunken, like they had a bad fever. The swaying was more pronounced now, seeming to move from the waist side to side, back and forth. By this point, I had finished rolling a second cigarette and gingerly held it out towards them, but I didn't get any closer. I had decided that if this weirdo wanted a cigarette, they were going to need to come out of the creepy alleyway. They didn't come closer, didn't make any movement at all, except from that damn swaying. For some reason, the thought of an anglerfish popped into my head. The single point of light dangled into darkness, hiding the things that lures you in. The description heightens the eeriness of Nathan's narrative. A person without a face, and the rest of the description draws attention to the narrative's uncanniness. Nathan's analogy, comparing the figure to an anglerfish, helps to visualize the event as it connects the figure to an animal we usually do not see, an animal from the depths of the ocean whose face is somewhat disturbing and menacing, and the light is simply a way to hide its darker motives. Perhaps you have also noticed that the statement is accompanied by sounds, that are not part of the diegetic world. John is in the archive in London and not generating these sound effects himself. Time and space, Baldick's two features, come to be blurred in John's reading, underlining the Gothic character of the podcast once again. But it also allows for a strikingly immersive experience for the listener. The sound effects help to imagine the events that John reads out even more and adds to the mental picture the podcast creates. John's reading similarly tries to resemble and emphasize the emotional state of the people who originally gave the statement to connect to a more authentic experience. Finally, John talks about the archives follow-up investigations and though no real connection between other disappearances seem to have been established, Sasha, Sasha took the liberty of running a photo through some editing programs though, and increasing the contrast appears to reveal the outline of a long, thin hand, roughly at what would be waist level on a male of average height. I find it oddly hard to shake off the impression that it's beckoning. <laughs>
So the show incorporates all the classic and cliche tropes such as vampires, ghouls, doppelgangers, ghosts, zombies, evil butchers, possessed entities, parasites, and so on. And these encounters take place in deserted houses, cemeteries, museums, ruins, but also in the people's homes. This certainly ties in with Eve Sedgwick's Gothic formula. She points to in a seminal text, the coherence of Gothic conventions, a list of noted cliches that underline the makeup of a Gothic story. The show pairs these statements with an overarching storyline of an institute that exists because of these strange happenings. The institute has a distinct academic interest in these occurrences and houses an entire archive and catalog of statements regarding the weird. In effect, the archive works a potpourri of old and new, past and present. And similarly, Murray Leader notes on contemporary ghost stories that ghost stories and the Gothic are by no means perfect synonyms, but there is a significant overlap between the two, especially in iconographies like gloomy cemeteries and dark houses and themes like inheritance and the relationship of past and present, modernity and the archaic pre-modern. And the podcast uses this notion for its narrative outline. The Magnus Archives connects iconograph iconographies of the supernatural to the mundane, as we could listen to these occurrences while doing the laundry or cleaning the dishes over or in the dark basement by ourselves. In the Magnus Archives, the eeriness is created through a combination of statements and following up stories, checking for its truth, connecting stories and establishing a history. Reading out the statements, John Sims, the archivist, first allows us to draw these connections while listening ourselves, before resolving these for us at the end of each episode. But the more into the show we get, the less connected and less intrinsic these stories also become, and the effects of the statements on the Institute members become more pertinent as well. The past just comes back to haunt the present. As Simon Hay has noted on a modern British ghost story, the ghost is something that comes back, the residue of some traumatic event that has not been dealt with and that therefore returns the way trauma always does. To be concerned with ghost stories is to be concerned with suffering, with historical catastrophe and the problems of remembering and mourning it. Ghost stories are a mode of narrating what has been unnarratable, of speaking such history belatedly, of making narratively accessible historical events that remain in some fundamental sense inaccessible. The figure of the ghost as a present absence, there and not there, both at once, visible and yet invisible, makes the ghost story singularly well suited to such a narrative task. The Magnus Archives plays with this notion of things, events and memories that have almost been forgotten and cannot be made sense of, that resemble folk tales and stories that are laced with history that present the weird encounters of the everyday. More so, the act of revisiting these stories inadvertently also resurrects the evil contained in them. The entities use the analog medium of the tape recorder to enter the diegetic world of John's London. Murray refers to Gavin, Kevin Wetmore's notion of technoghosts, spirits that display the physical properties of electronic or techn technical media. The physical appearance involves static, appearing blurring, featuring interference, as if they are being broadcast. Manifestation is both, made, is both made possible by technology and mediated through it. Magnus Archives is a place where past and present meet, and by revisiting the stories, the past comes to effect, affect the present and future as well, as John becomes more and more involved in the archive secrets, and the recordings reveal the different, complex, overarching premises of the storyline. The characters from the statements come to life through John's readings and also appear in the diegetic world. While season one establishes John's position as the archivist, as well as figuring out his role in the archive and the sort of relationships that he has with the other employees, seasons two and three allow for other characters, and John as well, to step up and step into the role of heroes, trying to save humanity. Again and again, the archives heroes come close to losing to the evil entities that they face, but because of their friendships and union, they manage to save the day. Seasons four and five heightens the stake, heighten the stakes of these confrontations, 
with season five also presenting the season in which, spoiler alert, for those who are still um, not, you know, made it to the end of the show, John and colleague Martin start their romantic relationship. Romance in the Gothic is the title of the series, and we find romance in the Gothic narratives of the Magnus Archives as well. Martin and John's budding relationship in particular comes to play a bigger role within the Magnus universe. John and Martin's romance even helps to save the world, stressing the power of their union. This perhaps comes as a surprise if we consider once more John's introduction, when he announces that I've managed to secure the services of two researchers to assist me, well, technically three, but I don't, but I don't count Martin as he's unlikely to contribute anything but delays. Well, they've, uh, they've, um, this changes in the, in the, in the podcast. <laughs> The Gothic is romanticized in the Magnus Archives as John and Martin find each other despite and because of the strange occurrences the Archive has to deal with. As a matter of fact, other characters in the podcast are also identifying as LGBTQIA and thus coincide with William Hughes and Andrew Smith's observations on the Gothic and queerness, noting that Gothic has, in a sense, always been queer. Although it is woven into the narrative, the characters are never defined by their sexualities and rather establish themselves through their actions for the community. Perhaps because of the positive portrayal of queerness, fans have taken to YouTube and other platforms and created fan art. Fan art has taken single episodes and overarching storylines and given a face to the characters and creatures of the podcast. These adaptations often eschew the actual audio recording and pair the visual artistry with alternative musical numbers. Most importantly, the artists create and transfer their own vision of the protagonists, owing to the lack of visuals, and cast people of color, characters in culturally appropriate attire, for example, a hijab, as well as exploring the character's sexual identities beyond the established lore. All these revisions work towards an argument that stresses the adaptive potential of podcasts that allows for transfer to other media, such as video, videos on YouTube. An emerging genre, considering podcasts through the lens of adaptation studies, also engenders discourse on the erasure of genre boundaries and the possibilities for diversity and inclusion in adaptation processes. Indeed, the cast of the Magnus Archives is already remarkably diverse and comprises predominantly members who identify as LGBTQIA, as noted before. Certainly, a central focus of the podcast are the interpersonal relationships of the characters. These pairings, or ships, have always been one of the major topics that producers at the fan's behest addressed in the show's Q&As. It should be noted that the Magnus Archives put center stage fan participation. Besides uploading a Q&A session for each of its five seasons, the series producers and creators choose stories submitted by fans to be recorded by the original voice actors of the podcast. This follows or is in tune with Henry Jenkins's idea of participatory culture. Rather than talking about media producers and consumers as occupying separate roles, we might now see them as participants who interact with each other according to a new set of rules that none of us fully understand. Indeed, fans are seen as important collaborators in the production of content and as grassroots intermediaries helping to promote the franchise, understood as collaborationists. Fans become actual contributors on the Magnus Archives podcast as they collaborate with cast and crew. Other listeners and fans are then able to listen to their stories, underlining the show's inclusive and immersive fan culture. Fans are also thus tasked to pick up the pen themselves and create their own story for the horror anthology. I want to focus on fan phenomena outside of this conscious and organized fan participation. The Magnus Archives fans have taken to online social media platforms such as Twitter, Tumblr, and YouTube, particularly to add their visions of the show beyond the recordings. As Jenkins has noted, fans have always been early adapters of new technologies. Their fascination with fictional universes often inspires new forms of cultural production, ranging from costumes to fanzines and now digital cinema. Fans are the most active segment of the media audience, one that refuses to simply accept what they are given, but rather insists on a right to become full participants. While the podcast relies on an oral storytelling mode, fans have shifted the audio narrative to audiovisual media 
quite literally giving the story and characters a face. It is particularly this visualization that allows for a diverse and inclusive casting of the characters. As the podcast recordings are usually divided in a case reading and embedded dialogues, the protagonists are predominantly not described explicitly. In effect, while the monsters and a human creatures are described in minute detail, the cast members are kept pointedly vague. The audio medium allows for listeners to imagine their own cast of characters and actors and the world they inhabit. Indeed, fan participation and podcast adaptation start at the level of promotion or framing. We already listened to the podcast intro of the Magnus Archives. Now let's watch a fan-made trailer for the podcast. So this is going to take a minute or something, just so Sam knows. Yeah. All right. Okay, so while the podcast has no visual trailer, the protagonist John Sims, the archivist, in the fan-made trailer is shown to navigate his steps through the Institute, where he encounters supernatural phenomena and is joined by various other employees. While still presented as a mystery story and crediting the podcast creators, the fan-made trailer cuts back on the eeriness of the podcast intro and thus also obscures the podcast's more horrifying character. As no audiovisual trailer exists, fans have ultimate free reign to create their own vision of what they believe could appeal to and attract new listeners, allowing them a considerable level of diversity and inclusivity in their choices. The trailer is an active effort by fans to promote YouTube users to listen to the podcast episodes, which are also uploaded to Rusty Quill's YouTube channel. Given the lack of visuals, fan art is principally occupied with personal casting constellations for the characters on a podcast. And here are two examples that I brought you today. So this is one that I found on Twitter and it's from 2021. So last year, and you can see sort of the main cast, John, Martin, Tim, Sasha, Melanie, Bashira, Daisy, Gucci, Elias, and Peter. So. This would be image one. I'll give you a second to look at them. All right. And this is example number two from Tumblr. Who still remembers Tumblr, right? <laughs> so we've got the archivist, M. Blackwood, Martin Blackwood, Sasha James, Tim Stoker, Eli Elias Bashar, and Gertrude Robinson, and even more characters here. All right. As you can see, some characters share certain characteristics and others are completely different, but particularly John, Martin and Bashira are of note here. So I'm going to switch back and forth or go back and forth to, between these two examples now. John, the protagonist, is sometimes drawn as a middle-aged, dark skin type resembling the weird professor, sometimes already showing streaks of white hair, at other times, he is considerably younger. Perhaps because John is usually the one to narrate the story, descriptions of him are kept to a minimum, which leaves even more room for interpretation for the fans. This also allows listeners to identify and relate to John, and they can draw their own conclusions what John might look like. In contrast to that, Martin is usually shown to be bigger in size and wearing glasses, highlighting that body size and visual impairment do not stop Martin from fighting supernatural beings and the cup of tea and clutched hands, right? Also complement his more homely and affectionate descriptions. Bashira, she's here and here, remarkably almost always wears a hijab in fan-created drawings. She is a police officer and helps the Magnus Institute. And the casting and visualization of a Muslim woman wearing a hijab to be a police officer is surely a considerably inclusive decision on the fan side. These various interpretations demonstrate a high level of creative engagement and subsequently reign in a high degree of diversity among the fictional fan cast. This again is reminiscent of Jenkins' observations on fan communities, as fan works can no longer be understood as simply derivative of mainstream materials, but must be understood as themselves open to appropriation and reworking by the media industries. 
Visual interpretations speak to fans' desire to share their visions of the cast, prompted also by the lack of visuals provided by the podcast cast and crew. The same phenomena are observed when considering videos on YouTube. Owing to its media specificity, fan-made videos on YouTube can be categorized into two broad categories. One, videos that use the original audio track and visualize the narrative. Or two, videos that visualize the story or overarching storylines, but embed other audio tracks. And I brought you three examples. We're not going to watch them in total. <laughs> Here's an example of the first category. So a podcast statement with fan animated sequences. And as you can see, this is the first episode. So the episode I also talked about in more detail at the beginning of the show. I'm going to start the recording. The user here relies, sorry, <laughs> the user here relies on the statement read out on the podcast. And fan participation here lies in visualizing, i.e. adapting the story, exhibiting a creative engagement with the dialogue and statement. The other category pairs a visualization and adaptation of the narrative with extra diegetic audio tracks. And I'm going to show you a couple of seconds, uh, not the entire video again. And, and, example. and that's example number two. <laughs> Spoil everything. <laughs> Okay, so tellingly, the video is stylized as a PMV, a podcast music video, signaling a shift to the audio visual medium or mode. Most of these audio tracks are reminiscent of musical theater songs. Owing to the heightened level of theatrics, this allows for a considerably dramatic retelling of the Magnus Archives narrative. Even though this example has a more toned down audio track, Music substitutes the original dialogue, allowing for a recontextualization of the narrative and a considerable scaling back of the eeriness. Particularly, John and Martin's romance is often a central subject for these podcast music videos, underlining not just the importance of the relationship for the narrative, but also the positive resonance that listeners have to the depiction of a queer love story. In both these categories, the participation allows for a subjective interpretation of events and characters. Indeed, despite the narration of the case files, listeners can yet adapt these narratives to their own visions, as they, again, yet lack visuals. Again, descriptions of cast members John Martin and Bashira seem to share certain characteristics in terms of body size, skin color, age, and cultural or religious specifics in the various fan designs. This ties in with the idea of regarding the Gothic as transgressive, as breaking with cultural norms or social expectations. You and Smith argue that the tempting queerness that Gothic presents is, that, uh, is thus that of assimilation to the alternative, acceptance of the valid claims of heterodoxies that might be variously cultural, theological, political, or indeed sexual. In all these cases, the fan-made videos also decenter the horror in favor of personal relations and character development. By giving the monsters and characters a face as they immerse themselves in the narrative, not just by listening, but by visualizing their versions, the listeners perhaps no longer feel horrified. In summary, podcast adaptations enable a considerable level of and potential for diversity, particularly with the narratives issuing a more detailed character description in favor of dialogues. Fan participation allows for meaningful adaptation as creative engagement and identification and immersion with the story world is not sanctioned, but rather welcomed by the predominantly independent podcast production companies or hosts. Fan participants and communities help to support the podcast, not just financially through platforms such as Patreon, but more importantly, by shifting the narrative to an audiovisual medium and thus appealing to and attracting new and more consumers. The Magnus Archives makes for an interesting case study because of the successful structuring of the story and the way it engages fans to immerse themselves in a narrative. The podcast over the course of of three years, doing the mass, uh, managed to, no, four years, sorry, uh, managed to captivate more and more listeners with 200 different statements, Q&As, and fan episodes for listeners to lose themselves in. 
to try and solve not just small, but also the bigger puzzles themselves. Perhaps romancing the Gothic also means falling in love with the genre. The show led to a couple of sleepless nights for me, but once you overcome this very much ostensible fear in the beginning, you fall in love with the characters and the craft and the talent that is behind the podcast. Thank you so much 